Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can take a look at the mental health and personality characteristics that may be at work in the Azaria Chamberlain case. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at the timeline of this case, then the trial, then look at the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the timeline. This case starts on August 16, 1980. Lindy and Michael Chamberlain and their three children arrive at a campsite in Ayers Rock, Australia. The next day, August 17, Lindy was holding Azaria Chamberlain in her arms. This is one of her children. She was nine weeks old. She was exploring a rock formation called Fertility Cave when she looked up and saw a dingo staring at her and Azaria. She would later tell a detective that the dingo was casing the baby. Shortly after sunset, a woman named Sally Lowe, who was camping near the Chamberlains, was walking to the trash can, and when she looked behind her, she saw that the dingo was about four to five steps back. Just a few minutes later, Michael Chamberlain throws a piece of bread crust to one of the dingoes. Lindy reprimands Michael for encouraging the dingo's behavior. Not long after this, Lindy put Azaria to sleep in a tent with her four-year-old son, and promptly rejoined the other campers at a barbecue. She then heard a baby's cry, and she went back to check on Azaria. Lindy saw Azaria being taken by a dingo, which led her to recite the now famous line, a dingo's got my baby. We see this line later in movies, on the television show Seinfeld, and in other places. A dingo is a wild dog. It stands about two feet tall, and can weigh over 40 pounds. About 300 people in the area started to search for the missing baby. Oddly, Michael Chamberlain did not help them. He told another camper that Azaria is probably dead now. Then he said, I am a minister of the gospel. So two statements that seem unconnected. The first investigator on the scene noticed paw prints leading away from the entrance of the tent, and he noticed blood inside the tent. The dingo tracks led to an impression in the sand that looked like it was made by knitted weave. The theory was that the dingo rested by putting the baby down for a moment. Azaria's jumpsuit was found about a week later. It had a few tears on it and some blood on it. Lindy claimed that Azaria was also wearing a matinee jacket, but investigators could not locate that. Lindy would later offer an unfeeling description of a dingo's capabilities. When she described how a dingo could use its paws to peel the clothes off of Azaria like an orange. This really didn't help her. This made her seem cold and callous. Before this, her behavior had raised suspicions in other ways. She had taken the baby for a checkup, and it was dressed in all black. Some people found this unusual. The baby's name itself was thought of as suspicious, Azaria. The physician was so curious about the name that he looked it up and found that it meant sacrifice in the wilderness, when it actually meant whom God aids. Azaria's jumpsuit was recovered near where the family had been hiking, Earlier that day, the media promoted stories regarding the demeanor of the Chamberlains, suggesting that the way they were acting was not appropriate. And we see this theory emerges that Azaria was murdered as part of some type of religious sacrifice. So here we see the first inquest. The coroner rules that the Chamberlains were not responsible, and he criticized the police. Oddly, this inquest also found that even though a dingo killed the baby, the body was missing because a person had disposed of it. In 1981, we see another inquest. Here, a professor says that the blood on the jumpsuit indicates that Azaria's throat was cut. He also thought that he detected a handprint on the jumpsuit. He said that there was no saliva from a dingo on that jumpsuit, which of course was already explained by Lindy, who said that Azaria was wearing a manatee jacket over the jumpsuit. But without that jacket, people believed that the no saliva finding was significant. The media and the public started to turn against the Chamberlains. Lindy was charged with murder, and Michael was charged as an accessory after the fact. The Crown, which is the prosecution in Australia, did not have a body, a witness, a motive, or a murder weapon. Now moving to the trial and the outcome of this case after the trial. We see that the trial started in September of 1982. The Crown's theory of the crime was that Lindy was not in the tent, Rather, she was sitting in her car with Azaria. She killed Azaria, and that explains why there was fetal blood found in the car. She then waited a while, 
went back to the tent and sounded the alarm about the dingo taking Azaria. Then while people were searching the area, she disposed of the body and the murder weapon. Now Sally Lowe, that other camper who had been stalked by a dingo, testified that she definitely heard the baby crying, corroborating Lindy's account. This testimony really should have devastated the Crown's case. Their theory of the crime was that Azaria was already dead at this point. Sally also said that Lindy was only away from the barbecue for about six to ten minutes, a small amount of time to commit murder and temporarily hide a body. Another witness named Judy West said that she heard a dingle growl outside of the tent that contained Azaria five to ten minutes before Lindy sounded the alarm. In addition, a dingo had bitten Judy's 12-year-old daughter and pulled her away from Judy before Judy was able to scare the dingo off. So in looking at this, the prosecution witnesses actually helped the defense tremendously, or at least they should have. However, the evidence that convinced the jury would come in the form of the Chamberlain's odd behavior and the experts testifying about blood in the car. The defense was able to counter the so-called experts called by the Crown and bring many character witnesses in, as well as witnesses who had their own unpleasant interaction with dingoes at the campsite. Lindy and Michael both testified. Michael appeared nonchalant and lacked zeal, so he kind of lost points there with the jury, although in general it seemed like Lindy didn't come off nearly as bad. The Crown suggested that the jury should consider what a case against a dingo would look like. They indicate that if a jury was to find a dingo guilty of this crime, that jury would be laughed out of the court. Clearly, they never met the dingo mafia at Ayers Rock. In the jury instructions, the judge told the jury that if they were going to believe Sally Lowe's testimony about hearing the baby cry, which seemed like credible testimony, then the Crown's case was not true. So, with this information, a lot of people watching this case thought that there would be an acquittal here. There was a good deal of pressure on the jury to conform to the public sentiment. People were really not happy with Lindy's behavior. When she smiled, they labeled her sadistic and cold. When she cried, they said that she was faking it and being overly emotional. So really, Lindy couldn't win no matter what. And it does seem likely this influenced the jury somewhat. October 29, 1982, we see that Lindy was found guilty of murder. Michael was found guilty as an accessory after the fact. Lindy would get life in prison and Michael's sentence was suspended. As Lindy was in prison, a new report demonstrated that the blood that was found in the car was actually paint emulsion, so there was no blood in their motor vehicle. In January 1986, a hiker fell to his death near that campsite at Ayers Rock. As police were investigating that death, they found the manatee jacket about 600 feet from where the jumpsuit was found years earlier, which of course corroborated Lindy's story. February 7, 1986, Lindy was released from prison. In September of 1988, Lindy and Michael's convictions were overturned. Lindy would eventually be awarded $1.3 million from the Northern Territory government. In February of 2012, the dingoes were officially listed as the cause of Azaria's death. Now moving to mental health and personality factors, it does seem somewhat clear that the Chamberlain's behavior could be interpreted as odd, aloof, they did seem to have rigid thinking, and they were a bit gloomy and fatalistic. But even though we see some unusual thinking and behavior, this wasn't really consistent with murder. No matter what mannerisms they expressed, people found reasons why those mannerisms indicated guilt. I believe this was the first case on record of a dingo taking a baby. There was absolutely no precedent for this, therefore no comparison in terms of how parents are supposed to react to that. Yet people would look at the parents and say, their behavior really doesn't fit with what happened. Now, the Chamberlains did make some bad decisions that day. They were traveling with a nine-week-old. One could argue that that maybe wasn't the best idea under the circumstances. Michael fed the dingoes. That wasn't smart. And Lindy put two of her children in a tent and then left that tent unattended. This behavior is less than intelligent considering the recent run-ins with all the antagonistic dingoes. Now, the jury started deliberations with four guilty, four not guilty, and four undecided. They said that their decision came down to whether or not they believed a dingo was responsible for the death, indicating that they really didn't understand how the justice system worked. They couldn't sit with uncertainty or entertain any other possible theory of the disappearance. Their thinking was locked. They believed if it was not a dingo, it was definitely Lindy. Interestingly, even under their flawed reasoning, it did seem like the dingo was responsible. 
It's amazing they could think that a mother could commit such a crime, but they could at the same time believe a dingo could never do such a thing. I guess they didn't want to impugn the dingo's character. I think the most frightening part of this case, other than the death of Azaria, was how the prosecution was able to fabricate a story and then make up evidence to fit that story. How is there justice in convicting an innocent person? Was this really just a matter of they wanted to get a conviction at all costs? Was a dingo perpetrator not good enough for the prosecution? A person had to be held responsible for a human's death? Again, it seems like they're really worried about hurting the feelings of the dingoes. It's interesting, even with all the evidence proving that a dingo was responsible for the death and Lindy was not guilty, there are still some people today that believe a dingo could never commit this type of heinous crime. They say the dingoes have been unfairly accused. Some even say that no dingo has ever come forward and taken responsibility. I'm not sure they really worded that correctly. Although the statement is technically true. No dingo came forward. After the dingoes saw what happened to Lindy, can anyone blame them for distrusting law enforcement? I know whenever I talk about controversial cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.